welcome to another episode of My Shout, a podcast for men and the people who love them, where we take a light-hearted look at the heavy stuff that men don't like to talk about. Hi folks, yes here we are, episode number two already. Uh, this one is uh, was a very lucky coincidence that we got visited by a friend and she brought another friend of hers along who also happened to be, like me, diagnosed with ADD later in life. Uh, he has been treated now for about two years, and so obviously I had a lot of questions for him, and we decided to save those questions for on the podcast. So we did a you know a good, you know, about a 40-minute interview, which will follow shortly. Uh, but first, I would like to say a huge thanks to everybody that has supported the crowdfund project. Um, let's have a look here. Massive thanks to Brad, Alex and Ali, Grant, Katie and Maria, Dom and Glynn, Matthew, Jason, Ben, and Megan, and a couple of anonymous ones in there too. Um, huge thanks to you guys. It's making such a big difference. Uh, we will be able to be, we'll be able to put, to put together a much more professional sounding show, and far more regularly as well, with the help of some of the equipment that we will buy with that money. So, uh, my plan, hopefully, is to put out at least two a week, and that will be made far easier. Uh, with the new equipment, so massive thanks to you guys, you guys are rock, you are awesome. Um, But anyway, I won't muck around for too long, Uh, we'll get right into the interview now, and um, as always, if you have any questions, you can email me at myshoutpodcast at mail.com, or you can hit us up on the Facebook page, which is My Shout Men's Health Podcast. Uh, yeah, so hit us up with any questions you've got, any comments, feedback, whatever you like. If you have any suggestions for future shows, feel free to hit me up with those as well. Um, anyway, here we go with the interview with my f- new friend, Paul. through massive periods where I haven't played for like five years and stuff and and pretty much thought that I'd never do it you know just lost interest or you know usually some bad relationships <laughs> bad relationships with your guitar or bad relationships oh it was different <laughs> yeah no <laughs> I mean, I, that's true <laughs> um, did you have lessons or did you just no, mostly play I'm, I'm just entirely self-taught um <laughs> I, I tried to I tried to go for a lesson once, and I, just, <laughs> and I was just like, "What? What?" Like Start instructors again. sort of taking you to classes. Yeah, pretty much. But it, it was just relentless. Uh, my yeah, my attention loop had to had to find a way to, to uh, <laughs> distract myself and uh, prevent me from getting out the door. And so I, most of the songs I ever learned were when I had to be somewhere else. Ooh. But, I mean, you've obviously spent a lot of time sitting there playing it. <clears throat> is that more of a, like, when you just zone in? Sort of yeah, yeah, one exactly. One thing for hours and hours and yeah. hours. I go through, even now, like, I go through moments where I just feel like I can't play anything. <laughs> and then the times where I just, I feel like I'm listening to someone else. Yeah, you know right. that thing where you think your own jokes are funny some days and other days they're not funny? I always think they're funny. Oh, okay, <laughs> well, maybe I need another, another comparison. But, <laughs> but you get that on... Well, something you read back over your own jokes. No, you don't. No, that's you true. There are some ones you look back and you go, ugh. Ah, that was you cringe. No, no one liked that. Why didn't they like it? <laughs> I don't think I like it. You creep. Who is that? Oh, it's me. <laughs> you, get that, you get that pretty quickly if you get up on stage and you try something and you think it's just kind of cool. Yeah. And then you say it and it's just like, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> pretty good. That's I had a couple that I thought were going to crush and I was just like, damn it. Yeah. Nothing. But you can, you can hype up a joke too much. You can have too much expectation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and go, oh, this is going to be so cool. This is going to bring the house down. <laughs> right. And I've done that. I've done that. I did a turtle joke for the party. Okay. <laughs> and I get to the joke and I get to yeah. the joke. Or someone is like, oh, that's not funny. Like, what the fuck's wrong with you? Yeah. <laughs> and like, that's it. That's all I've yeah. got for the whole night. I might just go home. <laughs> and I often do. <laughs> so, we're talking about ADD, adult ADD. And you were diagnosed at the same age as me, um, and you've been treated for a couple of years. What did you seek out the diagnosis? How did it come about for you? Well, 
I ADD was something that I, I was in a lot of denial about everything that was wrong with me, and I'd always approached it from a, from a mental health model of being depressed or being anxious or uh, you know without any any kind of underlying cause. Like anxiety, anxious, yeah. or panic attack. Yeah, yeah. Why, why am I so anxious about everything, and uh, and uh, why can't I concentrate and all that sort of thing? And uh, I'd I'd been seeing the same psychiatrist for ten years, and and he made the call because I'd always presented to him with anxiety type uh, symptoms. It was only when I kind of turned up one day and and I was perfectly okay. Well, I thought I was perfectly okay, but he said, "I think you're just you know, a little bit overqualified in the ADD <laughs> department." And I went, "What, really?" I came in to get a clean bill of health and give me that. So, yeah, a lot of, a lot of things like fell into place with that. So, just going back a little bit, when you say presented with anxiety, because mm. a lot of people don't understand anxiety. I went through a stage where I would get short of breath mm. and I'd start trying to take deep breaths mm. and then I'd get tingly fingers and mm. numb lips and then I'd start to freak out and flip out and think I was dying of a heart attack. Yeah. And then also some days it would just be like this general underlying feeling for the whole day of I can't concentrate, I can't breathe, mm. and I assumed it was a physical thing. Mm. I thought it was a heart problem or a lung problem or something like that. And I think that's how a lot of guys get it. Like, was that how you experienced it? Absolutely. I, I I get a lot of different types of manifestation of anxiety. I get that. There's a shortness of breath. Um, I think the first time I ever had it, I I'd, I'd, I'd eaten a hamburger or something. It's, <laughs> That, that's an important part of the story. No, no, I like was, that. Actually, I was assuming that was critical. Absolutely. <laughs> and well, I inhaled a piece of lettuce, and and I thought that that was. And three days later, I felt like I couldn't breathe, and I thought it was the lettuce was responsible. For, Stuck you know, in your lung. Yeah, and, and I went to the doctor, and he sent me to a psychiatrist. <laughs> I think I've got lettuce stuck yeah. in my lung. <laughs> Get out of here! Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I can't breathe. I inhaled a small piece of lettuce. What? I inhaled it. Get out! Yeah, right. I am. But they picked up on pretty quickly. Like okay. This is probably anxiety. Yeah. Oh, if I look back, you know, I've pretty much had it my whole life since I was yeah. as long as I can remember. You know, I, I just put it down to other things. Like, yeah. You know, I've got a headache. I feel sick. I, you know, I'm dizzy. I don't know, whatever it was. Um, and you know, even now, like I try to look for triggers you know, for what when I start thinking about it, and it's almost like an over analysis of your own mm-hmm. of how you feel. Um, whether you, you know, can I breathe? Yeah. Is my thinking kind of normal, mm-hmm. like, or am I in a thinking pattern? That's and I and I started to get that. But what I learned later was that derealization feeling, where you're yeah. or depersonalization, where you kind of feel like you're not connected to the earth and everyone in it. You feel like you're kind of walking around in a dream state, and sort of I always said like observing it through a pane of glass, like you're correct. behind the glass watching it, but you're yeah. not in it. Yeah, but you're not actually interactive, and, and yeah. I think that it's a maladaptive way that we our brains cope with anxiety it's you know, mm. kind of fuzzes up our logic and we you know we're thinking too much about stuff and it almost you can't think straight when you're like that and yeah. I, I, I think it's your brain's trying to make you not think straight you see everything disproportionately you see and yeah. the good things feel better than they are and the bad things seem way worse yeah, yeah. i always found I, I could almost be kind of manic with it when i was in anxiety stages mm. but particularly the bad just the whole world's caving in and dying yeah. and we're, but a lot of guys have this and mm. never ask about it, never get looked at. Mm. And the, the thing with it too is it can be a symptom of something else that's underlying. And in mm. your case and mine, mm. probably the ADD or ADHD, whatever the case is. Yeah, you almost wish that uh, a lot of people would make that a discovery of something, something that gives them an explanation or, or an out, enables all the numbers to kind of fall mm. for them and, and, you know, why you behave. And I honestly think that my anxiety, my anxiety, Came as a product of not being able to force when I was a kid and having a strange relationship with my father and all that sort of thing. I had to do stuff and I was always getting in trouble at school. And, and it's not because I wanted to, I really, really tried. I just couldn't. And I think the anxiety was just building up because I didn't, I didn't have any explanation as to why I couldn't do things. You know, I just sort of put the label as lazy and, you know, that all my like reports, really... all my reports were always saying, you know, there's so much potential, such a bright yeah. kid, but, but lazy, you want to do any work. Um, that, that was explained to me by my psychiatrist as one of the key red flags they look for mm. in the diagnosis of ADD or ADHD is that constant one or two. I mean, everyone gets one or two reports where it says he could do better mm. or she could do better. But it's, he said when they hear it year after year mm. after year, mm. bright kid could do better, mm. lazy daydreamer, 
not achieving to their potential, unfulfilled potential. He said is the one of the number one things they look for, especially with children. But then in adults, that transfers over to your whole life. Yeah, correct. And that's what that's where to me the anxiety came from. Is I mm-hmm. didn't have any. Um, but that starts to become your inner voice. You start going, well, why can't you do anything? What's wrong with you? Yeah. You're useless. You're lazy. And your own inner voice starts to become that mm-hmm. that sort of thing. And and um. And then you've got the vicious circle of mm-hmm. you're you're constantly underperforming. So you feel worse because you feel worse. You're underperforming yeah. around and around and around you go. So how did you go at school? <laughs> yeah, well, I was certainly uh, outside the uh, principal's office a lot. And, but my I, my coping mechanism was, and probably still is, I used to just make jokes. At it. I used to be the class clown. I'd pull out something. And, you know, I had to make my world a bit more bearable. And the only way I felt I could inter- interact was trying to make a joke out of everything. It's, it's still, to this day, something that gets me through. And looking back now, if you had a child who was the way you were, what thing would you wish they had picked up on? What would have been a main thing that they might have noticed that they missed? Because you and I both got missed mm. until middle age. Yeah. And, um, Whereas the, the rambunctious, disruptive children, they get picked up, they get diagnosed, they get treated from young, and they get on with their lives. People like us flounder around for years and years and years, but there must be something that they could be looking for. Yeah, well, well for me and for you, it, it's just that inattentive sort of subtype, yeah. you know, that, that the daydreamers, as they call us, come from. And, um, and you kind of, you, you notice the concentration there, it drifts away, and I notice that uh, with some people, you're having a conversation with them, I can tell now when someone's <laughs> listening and when they're pretending to listen and when they're just <laughs> not even there. Yeah. Because um, you're so good at it yourself. Yeah, yeah. And you I mean, know when you're drifting off. Exactly. I don't do it. I, yeah. I've done it three times today, you know what I mean? I've had people have been <laughs> Only talking three. to me. You've had a good day. I don't know if people know because I'm kind of, you get that, people get that kind of, they look over to the side and that glazed look, you know, you can tell that mm-hmm. the attention's just drifting. Yeah. But see, everyone does that from time to time. The difference is mm. with people like us, mm. it's almost like the analogy that my psychiatrist said was, if two people set out on a 100-kilometer journey in a car, in, in two cars, one of them does the drive, and the other one does the drive, but the second car's front end alignment's out, and the car's continuously pulling to the one side, mm. and he's fighting the wheel the whole way to the drive. He's fighting it, fighting it, fighting mm. They might both get there, but one of them is exhausted. He's put uh-huh. a whole lot more effort into it, and for us paying attention, especially in conversations, it hurts. It, it's it, it, horrible. It builds, and that, that's what I've explained to it. Oh, I remember I've been in situations where I've had... I've had a lot to do in a day and I burnt so much petrol walking around in circles and building up pressure in my head and the day the day comes to an end and I've achieved bugger all but I am exhausted. I can't even and I've had to field questions about what did you do today? Ah oh, stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it totally Yeah. Oh, all this really you know, hard important Yeah, important <laughs> oh yeah, we don't even know where to start. Yeah, yeah. And I went and I thought to myself later, well it's just I don't really know where to start, yeah. and, and that was the, that's the hard thing on prioritization. I can't. I don't know what to do first. The pressure of not not knowing where to start is just what causes all the symptoms. And yeah. you know, you just can't put something first because what if it's not the right thing to do first? Mm-hmm. And that 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 pressure just you lose days over it, and, and I do. And it comes to a point where I've had to switch off at six o'clock at night and go, okay, well, I'm not going to get anything done. Yeah. And then I start to relax a bit. And I go, Oh, it seems easy to do now, now that I'm on reflection, but <laughs> you let yourself off the hook. But it's, it is we don't we're not pretty good we're not very good at letting ourselves off the hook. And especially, no. I think if you're diagnosed late in life, it's like this sudden epiphany mm. that you go, oh, that's what it is. I knew there was something that was different from me than most of the people around me. Mm. All my life, I was sure there was something different. And what is it? Am I an idiot? Am I just dumb? Mm. Am, am I? Maybe I am just lazy. Maybe I'm just. Really, really it's that lazy. duality because you kind of you know you are you you appear mm-hmm. and to yourself you appear right, but yet somehow mm-hmm. completely useless at the same time. The two, <laughs> the two yeah. you know, Paradox. things. Oh, yeah, yeah uh, superimpose the two possibilities. Uh-huh. And you're like, how can I be both? And you mm-hmm. go through that self talk of some days going, I'm good at stuff. You know, um, with people you might get a bit of positive uh, affirmations mm-hmm. from someone. You're really smart with that. Yeah. Words are English, and other people might. Another day, it's just like you know, can't you do a simple thing? You're uh-huh. like, how can I be both? How can I <laughs> yeah, possibly? exactly. And that—that that was the, the how it all fell together for me. It's like, how is it possible that I can yeah. 
I can't intellectualize why I can't do stuff. Yeah, I can't. Yeah. I can think about a lot of things in, in a lot of depth, and my mind never stops. But I can't work out why I can't clean the house without mm -hmm. going through an immense amount of anxiety about it, and then not knowing whether to do the kitchen first or the bathroom. Or I would say it's like the, I've noticed now that when because you get the one of the amazing things with this condition, if you want to call it that, is you the medication doesn't have any ongoing effect. So when it does wear off at the end of the day, you get to see yourself as you are, yeah. and I'll, I'll be trying to cook something, and it'll take me four trips into the pantry mm. to get a spatula. Yeah. Literally four trips. I'll come out with something different every time. I'll be like, damn it, how many times do I have to go in there to get the one thing? It's literally a metre and a half and a, a halfway, and yeah. I've done three rounds of this. And the worst, <laughs> the, worst part, the worst part of that is, is the more the pressure builds up, the more anxious you get, the more things drop out of your head, the, the, the less you can. Do. When you're under pressure, it's far worse. Way worse, yeah. 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 And, but you can't, so you, and, but you, you know that, but you can't avoid the pressure. You're like, mm. you can wake up in a day, you can have a list of things, you're going to go, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm just going to, I'm going to rewrite my list that I've written 18 times <laughs> in the last week. I'm going to simplify it. I'm going to take four things off it and I'm going to do them. But some, somewhere along that, and this is the way, I don't know if you're the same, but my mind will just start adding things to the list rather than mm -hmm. starting it. Absolutely. I just add things. I know. Absolutely. They're not even necessarily, they're not important. Yeah. I just go, because suddenly I feel like it's got this space or this pressure to do this <laughs> list of stuff. And, and I'm putting yeah. more stuff in my head. But on the way to that shot, I yeah. could do this and kill two birds with one stone. In the end, I've made, I've made the day impossible again and I'll achieve mm -hmm. nothing. Absolutely. Do you ever have the feeling, this is something, uh, a realisation I've just had as you were talking then about the list. That you see people around about New Year's and you see their resolve to make these big changes. I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. Mm. And for most people, it lasts a week or two in January and then mm. it's over. For us, or for me anyway, I don't know if it's the same for you, every day. Mm. That's my feeling every day. Today. Mm. Today is Absolutely. the day. Uh, today I will fill in my logbook at work. Today, yeah. for the first time ever, mm. I will put my laundry in the wash basket. Mm. I will remember where my keys are. I won't lose my wallet. Mm. I will pay attention when my wife's talking. Yeah. Every day yeah. for her, for me, yeah. feels like I'm, I'm making news resolutions. Yeah. And 10 minutes in, I go, I can't do this. I, can't do this. Yeah. I cannot do this. What the hell is wrong with me? And, and uh, I, I think that's, um, yeah, sometimes the resolution for me is just to walk from one room to the other and remember why I was in there. Um, oh, God, I, I, I am. I am. <laughs> Walking into, yeah. walking into a room and remembering why you were there I feels can, like a superpower to me They now. feel like they can't exist in the boat in the same universe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, I've walked literally, I haven't even made it to the room. I've got halfway there and remembered something I've left in the room and I've literally walked three, three circles <laughs> and haven't gone into either room and just had to have a bit of a lie down. The back and forth, yeah. the, loop, the little loops in the passageway. <laughs> yeah. I think I'm just going to go from here and people don't understand it. Yeah. That don't. Well, I say disorder. I'm by disorder. It's just anything that impairs normal functionality. It's not a disease or anything that can be cured of. Or... And that's one of the stigmas about it. A lot mm. of people don't want to call it a disorder, mm. but it literally impairs us. Mm. It's, it's. I mean, you can call it a disability. Mm. I mean, you're one of the call first it. other people I've met who were diagnosed late in life. But everyone mm. else that I've spoken to, generally very intelligent, mm. articulate, mm. creative, mm -hmm. and yet just stuck in like a swamp of inability yeah. to get anything done. Yeah, like, yeah, I, I often call it an avoidance loop. Um, um, the pressure of avoiding things is, yeah. just, is, is actually more, I'm more comfortable with the pressure of having to do things than actually do them. And I sometimes, and this is weird, sometimes when I push myself and I get things done, no matter how much pain it's causing me, I've actually physically made myself do things. I haven't felt better at the end of the day. I've felt no, worse. It's exhausting. I've actually gone, yeah. I'm having all these anxiety symptoms, like mm -hmm. full-on anxiety uh, as a result of having pushed myself. And I'm like, that's not fair. I thought that there'd be some kind of reward at the end of that, but there yeah. isn't. I, I get that as well, yeah. I, and that's something that was always said to me. If you just see the process through, you'll mm. feel better at the end. You'll yeah. feel the satisfaction. And for me, I... The satisfaction was never there. No. I've had some fairly big achievements in my life and the satisfaction wasn't there. I would get there and I'd be like, that was horrible. I mm. never want to have to do that again. Yeah. And and straight away after that thought, what next? Mm. Now what? Yeah, what are we doing now? <laughs> now I've set my the whole bar life, here. My whole life has been, I've been in this pressure of like, having to do stuff and now I've done what all I've set myself to do for the day. 
and then you just sort of sit there and, and for me anyway I start to analyze how I feel again and that's how I start to think about breathing might be a bit out or I might feel yeah. a bit dizzy in the head or am I thinking the right thing or, or, or some such thing so did you I'm sure you probably did did you get diagnosed with depression or anything I did I um yeah I did um I, I went through the you know the the, the medical model of following that and antidepressants and all that sort of thing. And, um, How did you find antidepressants? Because I was also there and I never, never did anything. hated them. No. Didn't like. I felt like, because uh, this is a weird thing, and you know, I, I like, there's a lot I like about the way my brain works. And, mm. and oh, There's definitely benefits to yeah, ADD yeah. brain. <laughs> Some, sometimes, yeah, sometimes I'm just, I'm absolutely euphoric. That, yeah, that creative and spontaneous. Weird. Yeah, exactly. Why yeah. wouldn't you want to be like that? Yeah, it would just exactly. be great if we could follow through on some of the things we come up with. Yeah, you can be, yeah, you, it's just, and I have those moments, and, and you're still plunged into that self-loathing and that kind of thing. It's pretty hard to avoid. Yeah. Um, we talking about? <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do that quite a bit. Yeah, so, yeah, sorry, yeah. people. Um, we were talking about being mis- other misdiagnoses. So I was myself diagnosed with bipolar, with depression, with possible psychosis. I was put on medication for all of these at different times in my life. And at the time, I remember thinking, maybe this is it. Maybe maybe we found it. And every time, a week or two later, I was like, this isn't it. And what ended up happening for me was I started learning to fake being okay and how to cover yeah. my tracks. And I'm lucky I married really well. I've got a wife who's amazing at covering my tracks. And the main thing for me was I got into a place where I'm comfortable. Reasonable, well, not really. I was just manageably uncomfortable. And I had someone around me who loved me who was helping me cover my tracks. And I never told anybody how I really felt. Ever. I resolved after my last wrong diagnosis with a psychologist that that was it. I'm never telling anyone how I really feel. You become deeply afraid of um, of how people would, you know, sort of react to you. Or yeah. They just, you know, people do. People don't know how to cope. No. You know. I, I actually went had an experience where, you know, my life kind of spiraled out, spiraled out of control and I just, I ended up in the ward for a couple of weeks and not many people really knew how to cope with that. Yeah. Knew how to, my family was good and they were supportive, but you know, people by and large, I that can cope, can, they just can't cope with, you know, mental illness. It's just, yeah. they've still got this stigma attached. They, they'll still like turn up to, um, mm-hmm. you, know, sub, you know, subscribe to Beyond Blue and all that and say depression's terrible and all that sort of thing. But when it comes to the nuts and bolts of, somebody in front of you that you know and love exactly it's it, difficult it, it is and people don't quite know how to cope with it and, um, so what particularly if you're a man uh, oh, that's because, because the, yeah. the, the worst you know, the, the massive or well, the big part of all of this is when you're male you're not you're just supposed to mm. bear it I mean fathers were like their fathers were like they just Absolutely. had to suck it up no matter what was going on and, uh, and if you talk about it you're a pussy or, or exactly. exactly what's going on yeah, suck exactly. it up come on you can't talk about things that's not what, <laughs> that's not what men do no and um, well, why isn't it what men do? We've got to get back to doing what men do. Yeah, you know what? This suffering alone kind of sucks. I don't really want to do this. And if that's what yeah. men do, maybe I don't want to be a man. <laughs> exactly. But I, yeah. in recent years, I've taken I'm of the opinion that, that that to be a man, you know, is to or to be truly strong and be a man is to have been a bit of vulnerability and and, and to own it. Mm-hmm. And and not, you know what I mean? I am scared, or I do feel alone. Yeah. I, and I'm saying this with a lot of I can, I can handle it and all that sort of thing, but I'm still going to say it. I, I'm, you know. Yeah. There's yeah. a I, I you know I did, I did Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, and there's a guy who's known as the, the Godfather of Jiu Jitsu, Hicks and Gracie. Uh-huh. Um, there's a documentary that's made about him called Choke, which follows him all the way through to a big fight in Japan. Right at the start of it, he, he the first thing on the I think it's one of the first scenes. It's him being interviewed, and he says. I hear men say all the time, I'm not afraid of anything. He said, that's stupid. He said, I'm afraid of everything. But I walk through my fear, yeah. I deal with it, I talk about it, and I face it. Yeah. I mean, I'm paraphrasing. But it was basically said. It's yeah. about understanding your fears, facing them, and working your way through. Yeah. Pretending you're not afraid yeah. is probably the biggest chicken move of all time. Exactly. I, I, it's, it's false. It, it, you, you're supposed to... Fear is a perfectly intrinsic you know, reaction to certain situations, uh, you know... It's a survival instinct. Exactly. You, you, you know, you'd be pretty, uh, you wouldn't like, you wouldn't survive long. You're not afraid of the tiger. Yeah. You're not going to last long to pass on your DNA. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. But but there appears to be a massive, 
those push in uh, you know, new age spirituality about you know, fear is like some kind of option or something like that. And I, I, don't, yeah. I don't subscribe to that. I don't think fear is optional. I think how you deal with it might be optional. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's get to where you've gone to your psychiatrist this time. Or psych- I'm just psychiatrist. Yeah, and and this for some reason you you feel like you're doing really well. You're pulling it together, and he drops the bomb on you. We think I think he might be telling you. What happened from there? Like, what were the steps between that and your formal diagnosis? Um, um, I mean, if you can remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's just going to go back that far. Yeah, I mean, that was a whole time. couple of years ago. So yeah, I yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I don't. I, I started to. I've always had a bit of an interest in psychology, so like it's obviously something I'd heard of, but it's not something that kind of applied to me. I just yeah. I always had that stigma of hyperactive kids running around mm-hmm. and that sort of thing. And, and he explained to me that subtype of in, you know, inattentive subtype, yeah. and I, I went away with that and I read up on it. And I went, and yeah, I it was like a punch in the nose. I'm just like, what am I reading here? You know, mm-hmm. like, so you really strongly identified with it. Now, you see. Absolutely, so everything. Like, wow. And I, I felt, I felt happy. I felt elated. I also felt angry and betrayed by the mental health system. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I realised that there's just human error involved in that yeah. you know, arena of psychiatry. But, um, but I, I felt like I had enough to a, a basis to kind of start rebuilding myself. I knew that I was going to, you know, build my self confidence and self worth, and all those a lot of work I had to do on that, but. But at least I had an explanation for why I didn't succeed academically in spite of, you know, the reasonable potential to do so. And, you know, I was kind of, even though I you can't go back in time, it made me excited for that point on. In the future. Like a lot of people have said to me, are you angry that it wasn't picked up early? Mm. And I keep saying, I'm so elated mm. that it doesn't have to be like that mm. anymore that I can't even exactly. start to think about what it might have mm. been. I, I can't even... I can't even be angry. I'm like, wow. Because a lot of people don't even get that, That you know, we, we might live another day, another year, another yeah. 20 years, whatever, but, you know, there's a lot to be, there's a lot of work to do, there's a lot of appreciation to have. There's people out there that will never get diagnosed, you know, they'll do their whole lives uncomfortable, yeah. anxious, and people still constantly say, worrying yeah. what's wrong with them. Exactly. People still, to me, and I don't, I still don't talk about it a lot, there is a stigma and people go, yeah. oh, that's, that's not a real thing, that's just, uh, that's kind of uh, <laughs> I love when people say that because yeah. I always want to say something like, if you were in a car accident and you lost a leg, mm. that would be exactly like me coming up to you and going, you've got another leg. Yeah. Of course you've got another leg. All humans have two legs. Mm. Just get up and walk. Yeah, stop, just, stop just get up and grow another leg. Yeah. Shut up and grow a leg. They don't understand the level of discomfort mm-hmm. and anxiety and stress and pressure. And we used to, oh, well, I, you know, in the... Um, I was a personal trainer for years and, you know, I you have this thing called perceived rate of exertion. It's, yes. it's not about the actual amount of it, it's about what it is to you. Say yes. like, you know, say a 90-year-old woman getting on the bike and, mm-hmm. you know, punching out a, a, a explosive power test and, you know, she might be a 10, whereas a professional athlete might be a 4. It's all about, and that, that's what your day-to-day living is like. Yeah. What, what is easy for one person is a mm. mountain for us. And that was the thing that was always like, that's the thing that always frustrated me. I yeah, why does it seem so hard? Yeah. You'd, look, you'd look around and see other people, other kids, especially in school. Mm-hmm. I'd look at them and think, I know I'm as smart, at least as smart mm-hmm. as them. Why are they doing it? They're doing homework. I'm watching them do homework. Oh, I still remember <laughs> the day. I remember looking around one day, I think it was first or second year in high school, looking around and going, holy crap, I think these kids are doing homework. Mm. I, for years, I just assumed that that was something we all just had silently agreed no one did. Exactly. And I looked around, I was like, fuck these people, they're actually <laughs> doing homework. Yeah. And I thought, what the hell is going on here? But anyway, so what was the process? So you did a bit of research into it, he didn't start treating you straight away? Not straight away. Oh, yeah. he, um, he spent the rest of that appointment talking about kind of what it was and what mm-hmm. the treatments are and the fact that it's not... It's not. It's it's just what you are. It's like a classification of um, kind of where you come from, and and, and all, you know, it's it's a disorder in the fact that it impairs normal functioning. But it's a perfectly, you know, it's perfectly understandable. And even yeah. explained to me like when you think about Stone Age genetics, and we couldn't all be the same. Some of us had to be hyper vigilant, and others had to do stuff, and you know, others had. And there to would think. obviously there'd be there would be obvious evolutionary advantages to hyper vigilance. Absolutely, and, <laughs> and and I think that's where it comes from. I, I think it comes from that hyper vigilance. Yeah. It might not necessarily; it doesn't fit into the model of how we all work in. Well, it does, but 
and that's what I'm working towards now. I'm trying to like go towards what I'm good at and forget the stuff that I can't. Mm. You know, it's just, just no point. I'm never yeah. going to be good at you know, the, and and that's why I'm going towards my creative arts and all that sort of thing. It might not be a rich and lavish lifestyle, but it's but it's what I'm good at. And since I've started forgiving myself, you know, greater things are happening. I, I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. forming closer bonds with people and that mm-hmm. sort of thing because I, I no longer have that question about why why am I so dysfunctional. Yeah. I'm still dysfunctional, but I know. I, I, <laughs> but you've made peace with it. I, I have. I've, yeah. I've gone, well, it's okay, you know, and just and started to in, and basically started to enjoy the good parts of it. Enjoy the sort of witty inside. Enjoy, enjoy the kind yeah. of, sometimes you're just walking along and you just, you're just so grateful about so many things. Mm-hmm. And, and it can just be, we don't need much to be happy. We're not. But because of our experiences, you know, when we're not chasing wealth or you know, houses or castles, it feels like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, I just, I don't care that I haven't made a lot of money and maybe if the diagnosis was made 20 years ago or something, things might have been different, but maybe it wouldn't. Maybe this and is the way it's, it's meant to be. relatively, I'm only a month and a bit in and you're a couple of years in. It's yeah. still actually early days. Mm. And this is what my psychiatrist was very careful to impress upon me. He said, finding this out mm. is going to put a piece into the puzzle that's been missing for you forever. Said you have, he said that you have to kind of be prepared because everything might change. Mm. You may have put yourself into a job where you're comfortable. Mm. You might get bored with that job. Mm-hmm. You may be doing other outside recreational activities that were designed, or not designed, but you chose it because they provided you with some sense of relief. You may be heavily invested in those. You may lose interest in those. Yeah. You may change everything. Yeah. And he said, you know, kind of be prepared. It's going to be very, very different. And it's, as I say, I'm only a very short amount of time, and it's, it's phenomenal. Mm. So when, so he spent a bit more time maybe educating you about it. Correct. Before um, treating it with medication, which, of course, we're going to have to get to that, because that's the thing yeah. everyone hates about ADT. <laughs> well, it's the, 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 the stigma, that's where yeah, the stigma lies. That's, that's the elephant in the room. Yeah. yeah. Um, how long before, how long after the diagnosis, or how long from the beginning of the discussion Till you started on the medication, probably a couple of weeks, and and then I was put on Ritalin, I, uh, which is a slow release version. It is, it is. It's kind of a more often prescribed version. It is, yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, it didn't, and uh, yeah, and I've heard it has like very good results. It didn't quite. I just I felt like some of the stuff was varied a bit. We didn't really agree with me, basically. And uh, I went back, and you know, we decided to try. Try dexamphetamine, and uh, which yeah, it was interesting. It, it doesn't. It's weird. It's almost like uh, it doesn't. To me, anyway, it doesn't fix everything. It just enables you to, um, in a in a weird way, speeding things up kind of makes you focus more. Slows you down. It's the weirdest. I can't describe <laughs> that to anyone with any great. Uh, well, the way the way my the, my guys explained it to me was that. One of the things with ADD is it's actually a structural difference in the brain. We rely a lot more on our frontal lobe, mm. and everything is moving everything's a lot on faster. the fly. Everything's and on the fly. He even went as far as to say to me, "Look, we know this drug works. It's been working for years and years and years. Mm. It's proven. We know it works on the ADD brain." Mm. He goes, "We don't know why it works. <laughs> yeah. You people, it has a paradoxical effect mm-hmm. because if you give these." Pills to somebody else that mm-hmm. doesn't have ADD, they'll be climbing the walls, jumping up and down, grinding their teeth, mm-hmm. and jabbering along at 100 miles an hour. Mm-hmm. He said, We give it to you people, you sit down and talk. Which is interesting because I, I guess that, that's, that's how they make a lot of um, a lot of the adult diagnoses that they do is because you know, they find there's a history of uh, substance abuse, and mm-hmm. that substance abuse is generally stimulants. Yes. And, uh, and Absolutely. And you can, you know, you can say, well, it's weird, you know. I take stimulants, and I can, <laughs> and I'm sit, I can sit there quietly, and all my friends are off dancing on the yeah, floor, exactly. and we're sitting there chatting, or have, just sitting there. Have I been ripped off quietly? <laughs> <laughs> but also comfortable for the first time. Actually, like okay, in your own head, mm. you're sitting there. You don't have the darting anxiety. Like, I can talk. I'm not actually analysing every word before it comes out of my mouth. I'm like, I can stay in this chair for an hour, mm. and not feel like I have to do ten other things. Yeah, exactly, and and that's yeah, that's what it's like. It's just that mental. Yeah. Shut up. <laughs> so one of the ways I explain it to people is that I feel like my whole life I've been sitting in a movie cinema mm. looking at the movie and I go, this is not making any sense. I'm not quite following it and mm. everyone else is following it. And when I started on Dexamphetamine, it was like somebody came over and went, hey, dummy, 
Mm. Here's your 3D glasses. Mm -hmm. And they put them on me and I'm like, oh, shit, wow. Well, this movie's amazing. All of a sudden I got it and I was like, oh, now I'm part of it. And I'm the one making the decisions. I feel like I can wake up in the morning and go, today I want to go for a run. Mm. And at the time when it's appropriate, Mm. I'll go for the run. Mm. Whereas before I always felt like it was like a roulette wheel with decisions on it. And no. wherever it happened to stop, that was what I was going to do. And there was no, no, uh, none of my own will involved. Mm-hmm. I felt like stuff happened to me. Mm-hmm. I didn't do stuff. Things happened to me. Mm-hmm. And that was the biggest change for me on the day. I mean, and I still notice now, in the end of the day, when it starts wearing off, I can tell. It's just like, oh, here we go. Mm-hmm. Like I'm in a room and all the TVs are starting to come on. <laughs> right. Yeah. But at least now there's, you've got that relief of knowing, oh, look, we're in off for today. I'm going to be okay tomorrow. Yeah. I'll be okay again tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. One of my hippie friends used to try to tell me to be in the moment. <laughs> Which moment? Yeah, exactly. I've got about 45 yeah. going on. Do you have any idea how many how many tabs I've got open at the moment? <laughs> That's right. We've got you know, too many tabs open. <laughs> I, I, I just can't close them all. I'd love to just be on one page. You know, yeah. Awesome and all. And, and I appreciate you can do that. But and And, and that's what a lot of people tell you is... Yeah. It's all in your head. It's all in your head, kind of thing. Well, well, and why would you choose that? But why that's exactly you? right. It mm. is all in your head, but it's it's a brain yeah. thing. It's, yeah, it's, it's real. Yeah, yeah, it's real. And when I do see there's all these Facebook pages. There's one called ADD is not real, yeah. <laughs> and their whole thing is that we just do it to get drugs. If oh. we did it to get drugs, we would be slamming those things down our neck all day long. Mm. The one thing I've come across with most people is that we are terrified of even being thought of of abuse. As, as abusing our medication. Mm. For me, it's like a holy sacrament. It's like this stuff is yes. sacred. Yeah. I do not want to fuck with this. You don't even want to uh, exceed your dosage because no. you want the therapy. Because if, it's, if it works, you don't want to... Um, it's not like recreational drugs, more, 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 go off the rails. Mm. I, I want this to work and I know that if I go off the rails with it, there's nothing beyond that that's really going to help me. So you actually... Yeah, if they take this away, I am fucked. Yeah, yeah. Please, please don't take this away. <laughs> yeah, please don't take it away. And we, the thing to really impress on people is we don't get high on this stuff. No, you would get high on it. We don't. I, I, uh, I don't often notice. Like I often take it and forget I've had it, and then I only know that I've had it when it starts to wear off. Yes, because then I'm exactly. like, exactly. Why do I feel a bit sort of spaced out? Like, yeah. Oh yeah. For me, yeah. I described it when I first the first week or so. People will say, "Well, what's it like? What's it like?" And I'd say, I can only tell you what it's like now compared to what it's like when I'm not on it. Mm. And for me, when I'm not on it, there's a, a knot in my stomach mm. and I feel like I've got weights on my shoulders mm. all the time. And I had that feeling my whole life and I didn't know I had it yeah. until I went away. Yeah. And I realized, holy shit, I think most people don't feel like that. No. <laughs> no. So to wrap it up a little bit, if you, let's say you suspected friend or family member may have this. Mm. Well, how would you approach it? I mean, because we're sensitive people too. Yeah. <laughs> how would you bring it up with somebody? Say it. Say it. 25-year-old friend of yours, who you look at them and you go, oh, here we go. Here's another squirrel. Yeah. How well, would you well, bring it up? Not, that's not relevant. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. That could, no, that could be relevant. Yeah. Let's say it's a workmate. Male workmate. Mm. It does. Well, it does and it has come up. You, you obviously, if you're fairly thorough in your own research and all that sort of thing, you start to spot uh, not just behavioural patterns, but... Uh, just personality traits. Too. You yeah, see yeah, people this, who this... are covering their tracks the whole time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you see that. And um, I generally wouldn't... Uh, I don't think I'd... Br- I don't know. It's kind of come up you know, mm. in my life in recent times and because oh, it's been a while since I've been diagnosed and that sort of thing. And, and usually the way it's come up is people have... Yeah, you know, I'm similar to them. We end up getting along. We end up yeah. talking about this sort of thing, and I, I'll sort of share my experience, and they'll be curious. But but people are, I find they're curious, but not necessarily. You know, they, they're, they're kind of skeptical as well. They don't know quite where they sit with this whole thing. Well, I'll be honest. Before I was diagnosed, I thought ADD was really good too. Yeah, I always thought those are just naughty kids, and I didn't yeah. have no idea that this mm. could be an adult thing mm. at all. Never even thought of it. Mm. I literally was like, no, they're just naughty kids. You're shitty parents. Mm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get it together. Yeah. Um, but I guess you could probably steer them towards some of the online tests. There's a few online tests. You yeah, can either exactly. Give you a rough idea. And I've kind of, I've kind of done that. I, I try not to uh, 
you know, put my psychiatrist hat on too much. <laughs> yeah. But uh, and but it's hard too because I've had negative experiences with yeah. psychiatry and I've had wrong diagnoses and all that sort of thing. Oh, that, so I'm kind of say so maybe you should go to a psychiatrist, but then again, yeah. maybe you shouldn't. I oh, like I don't know. Yeah, it's really hard to. But one thing that I have to stress about is is my diagnosis was a long time coming. I got yes. to. Uh, you know, know a mental health professional over a long period of time, and we had a working relationship. Mm -hmm. So this wasn't just, you know, I didn't, I didn't come in, I didn't just present with a set of symptoms saying yeah. I think I've got this and trying to diagnose. So he really something. whittled it down over time. It, eventually, yeah, yeah. yeah. He, just, he just started eliminating other things, and I just, and then I just used to start asking questions about why can't I do stuff like that? Like, what, what is this block? <laughs> yeah. And um, which yeah. are the perfect questions for me to slowly figure it out. Yeah, but once you kind of remove all the the life stresses and situations, mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, well, no, that was awesome. So thanks so much for that. Like, that was a really, really good talk. Maybe you could uh, play us out on the end. Is there <laughs> anything you want to plug? You want people to hit you on Twitter or Facebook or anything? You don't have to. Um, you could just be Man X. Uh, I'm going to tell everyone you didn't Yeah, I'll be Man Paul, X. Right? You can call me Paul, but uh, Man <laughs> X. Paul, Paul D. You like it. Thanks, Paul X. <laughs>